definitely going to have your attention since it's uh, 12 already. Uh, was anybody taking it out for another reason? I don't know, were they roll up on the I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Um, I can get a little quiet here. Uh, Philip Cleaves, who is a uh, candidate for the uh, faculty position. Um, he has a, a variety of interests. He's originally from the University of Arkansas, uh, where he got his bachelor's degree. Then he went on to the uh, University of, of California at, at, uh, at Berkeley, where he worked uh, in the lab of uh, Craig Miller. And he did a lot of work with his sticklebacks there. So although he is not only a coral person these days, he has worked with vertebrates as well, although we don't hold that against him. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, in fact, that's kind of it's kind of been intriguing. Um, uh, he um, then went on to do a, a postdoc at Stanford. Um, by the way, he, he was his PhD was in molecular and cell biology. Um, he went on to do a postdoc at Stanford, which is his current address in actually the um, School of Medicine in the genetics department uh, with John Pringle, and this is where he established his. A lot of his current interests in corals, uh, coral symbionts, uh, and um, and so forth. Uh, on, a, a, as a sideline, he is a, a scientific advisor to the Moore Foundation. So, if any of you want to learn more about the Moore Foundation, um, you can certainly uh, uh, talk with, uh, to Philip. Um, I'm hoping that uh, as many of you as possible will have an opportunity to interact with him over the next couple of days. Uh, I had breakfast with him and found him to be a very um, engaging uh, conversationalist. And uh, go on. We got a, and we got a delicious meal. So, um, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Phil. Thanks. Um, and so first I just want to thank the everybody in priority here, I'm excited to talk about the work that I've done in John Pringle's lab for the past four and a half years and my future plans to study the molecular cellular basis of dian dianoflagellate uh, coral symbiosis and its breakdown. Um, but before I get into the real meat of my talk, I'm going to tell you about who I am. I'm a molecular geneticist that likes to investigate long-standing ecological questions with novel molecular tools. And I really fell in love with coral biology as an undergrad when I studied abroad in Australia and worked at the Australian Institute for Marine Science. There, I um, realized that I was interested in the molecular genetics of many aspects of coral biology, and so I developed this long-term plan to get a PhD in molecular biology, and then as a postdoc, study coral biology with that molecular training. And so that's exactly what I did. And so I did my PhD at Berkeley, um, and uh, in the molecular biology department, I was really lucky to find a lab that was studying a really cool ecological system, three-spine stickleback fish. And this is a pretty much an excellent model system to study the genes that control morphological evolution in vertebrates because they're a distinct marine and freshwater morphs. The freshwater fish are derived from the marine fish, but you can still cross them in the lab, so you can actually find the genes that control morphological evolution between these two types of fish. And we were interested in the skeleton, um, and so I was working on a trait that we found to be different between marine and freshwater fish, and that freshwater fish have a twofold increase in tooth number that occurred around the same time that the marine fish changed their diet relative to their marine ancestors. So, so through a bunch of um, genetic mapping experiments, including QCL analysis, genomic scans, and expression studies, I was able to find that this twofold difference in tooth number is partially um, underlied by a cis-regulatory allele of BMP6. BMP6 is a uh, master developmental signaling pathway, and we found that uh, changes in BMP6 expression appear to, to, uh, to regulate tooth number between these two fish populations. Um, and in genetic scans, we're actually able to find DNA differences in a cis-regulatory allele that controls where BMP6 is expressed in teeth, and we found, we think that some of these uh, sequence differences are actually the DNA changes that cause the evolution between marine freshwater fish and drive the differences in tooth number. Um, and so this was really fun to be able to go from an ecological trait all the way down to DNA changes that we think are driving that trait. Um, but after my PhD, I decided to go back to my initial love, which was studying coral biology. And so I've been in John Pringle's lab for the past four and a half years. 
studying coral symbiosis and trying to get a better understanding of its molecular biology. Um, and I remember the first time I fell, I really like, became interested in coral biology is when I was studying abroad in Australia and I was diving on the Great Barrier Reef and I was struck by the, how magnificent the ecosystems can be and how much biodiversity that the ecosystems support. And the success of corals to build coral reefs and sustain that biodiversity is due to an endosymbiotic relationship that corals have with dinoflagellate algae. So corals have two cell layers, an epiderm and a gastroderm. Inside the gastrodermal layer are, are the algal symbionts that are critical for a nutritional symbiosis. If you zoom into these gastrodermal cells, you can see I've drawn an uh, algal cell, alga sitting inside of a host-derived vesicle called a symbiosome. The algae undergo photosynthesis and translocate photosynthetic products to the host cell in the form of glucose and sterols, for example, and in return, inorganic nutrients in the form, form of ammonia. Now this is an absolutely critical symbiosis for corals, and we know that in part due to the fact that the symbiosis breaks down upon thermal stress. So when corals get one or two degrees higher, hotter than what they usually see in a region, they can undergo a process called bleaching, and this is when the algal symbionts are expelled from their tissue. We call it bleaching because in losing their algal symbionts, they lose this pigmentation that's derived from the algae, and the tissue becomes transparent, and you can see the calcium carbonate skeleton that's white underneath. Now, if water temperatures stay high and the, al and the, al and the corals aren't able to repopulate their tissues with algae, they'll starve to death and die, and it, in turn, coral bleaching is actually causing mass mortality of corals all over the globe. And the frequency of major global coral bleaching events is increasing due to climate change. One striking example occurred in 2016 on the Great Barrier Reef um, that's on the northeast coast of Australia that I'm showing here. And then over about a two week period of warm waters, we lost about 30% of the Great Barrier Reef due to bleaching. And just to put that into perspective, the Great Barrier Reef is about the size of Italy. So that gives you a perspective of the amount of uh, distress that these ecosystems are encountering due to climate change. And despite the havoc that's really um, being, being that's really occurring on these on these marine ecosystems that are important, we know very little about the molecular genetic basis for how the symbiosis is coordinated and why corals bleach in the first place due to stress. And that's largely due to the fact that, difficult, that corals can be often difficult to study in the lab. For example, they can come in inconvenient sizes. The idea of taking this into the lab and working with it is uh, sometimes daunting. And when they are in appropriate sizes, they're actually difficult and slow to grow in the lab. They have hard calcareous skeletons that make biochemical assays tricky and also prevent certain types of live imaging. And importantly, bleaching causes death, and so it's often impossible or very difficult to clear corals of their algal symbionts to ask what the physiological consequences of having a symbiont, well, that's not death, um, is. And um, there's also only seasonal access to larvae, and so the second half of my talk, I'm going to tell you about my attempts at building genetic tools in corals to study gene function. And um, this will become important, that there's only seasonal access to larvae. Okay. So in the Pringle lab, we've been working on a small anemone Aptasia that we think, think is a great model system to use in the lab to study many aspects of coral biology. Aptasia, which is the small anemone, has many life traits that make it a pretty awesome model system uh, to work with. For example, and maybe most importantly, is that they're symbiotic with similar types of algae that, is found, that are found in corals. We can actually take algae from corals in the wild, infect Aptasia with them, and they'll form a stable symbiosis. So it's likely the case that anything we learn about symbiosis and Aptasia are going to be parallel in the coral systems. We can also grow them in convenient size ranges, so we can grow individual polyps for the sizes of 96 well plates for high throughput analysis, but also bigger if we need more material for certain types of analytical experiments. We can also grow them rapidly as large clonal populations through asexual reproduction. So we can take a single animal and then we can propagate it out and now use those for an experimentation and we're really controlling 
the host genotype, which is impossible or, or very difficult to do with corals from the wild. Um, they're also soft-bodied, which allows us to do outline imaging and other types of uh, molecular biology approaches. And importantly, we can culture them indefinitely as symbiotic or aposymbiotic states, so with or without their symbionts. And this allows us a really powerful opportunity to ask what the physiological consequences of having a symbiont are or not. And this will become important in the first half of my talk, when I'm going to talk about some of the insights we gained about coral bleaching using this method. And then we also have new experimental methods that where we can spawn Aptasia every week in the lab. And this allows us to do um, some reverse genetics. We use some reverse genetic tools that I'll tell you back about in the second half of the talk. So I'm really interested in um, three major steps of symbiosis. And it's not just me, it's the field in general. Um, first, how does a how is symbiosis early, how is it established? So how does an aposymbiotic coral or an enemy find appropriate symbionts from the environment in order to form a stable symbiosis? And we can study that in Aptasia. So here's some experiments from the Pringle lab where we've taken aposymbiotic Aptasia larvae and we've infected them with three strains of symbionts. And you could see that um, only two of the strains were able to form a stable symbiosis in Aptasia larvae, and two of the strains weren't able to. And so we're really interested in trying to figure out the mechanisms, the genetic mechanisms that control the uh, Aptasia larvae's ability to discriminate between different types of symbionts from the wild. And another interesting point here is that this early um, as this early specificity is actually the same specificity that you see in adult polyps. And so it's, it's carried on through the ontogeny of the, of the organism. And, um, but the molecular basis of this is really unclear. It's been hypothesized that the immune system is probably playing a role in this discrimination. Um, and that's going to become important later in my talk. So after the appropriate symbiotic partners are found, how is the symbiosis maintained? So how does a animal cell allow an algal symbiont to live inside of its tissue? Um, and I think that that's a really interesting question. And how did, what are the molecular changes that need to occur in order for those uh, symbionts to, to maintain, be maintained? How is the nutritional as aspects of the symbiosis orchestrated? How, uh, how does an animal uh, tolerate these algal symbionts? And these are questions that I'm interested in studying in my future lab. And lastly, we're also interested in the molecular biology of the bleaching process. So why is it that corals and anemones bleach in response to the heat? What are the pathways that protect uh, against bleaching or pathways that trigger bleaching itself? And so when I started my postdoc, I was really became interested in this last part of the symbiosis. And so we did a set of experiments in aphasia that told us, I think, about the mechanisms, or at least gave us ideas of the mechanisms of bleaching, but also gave us insights into all three steps of symbiosis. And the experimental paradigm that I used in order to investigate this was the fact that Aptasia can be bleached experimentally in the lab. So normally we rear Aptasia um, at 27 degrees, and we can move them from 27 degrees to 34 degrees over 10 days. And the Aptasia will gradually lose symbionts as they experience more time under heat. Here you're looking at images of Aptasia, and we're monitoring symbiont load by chlorophyll autofluorescent of the algae. So we can use these images to kind of um, estimate bleaching curves, or we can actually measure bleaching rate more carefully with flow cytometry. And here's an example of that type of experiment. On the x-axis is time at 34 degrees, so time at heat. And I, the, the y-axis is a percent symbionium remaining. And as you see, the more time the animals experience at heat, they, they, they gradually bleach. And so I was interested in trying to do some experiments to try to ask the question whether or not, uh, what genes in Aptasia are involved in bleaching. <coughs> and so the experiment I did is I did an early RNA-seq time course of symbiotic and aposymbiotic anemones experiencing heat stress. So what I thought this would allow us to do is find differential gene expressions that are correlated with the onset of heat, and then also ask how those genes behave with or without a symbiont. So we found out a lot using this data set, but I'll have, I have time for about two stories. And first, there are 
um, involve a set of genes that are involved in their early heat stress response. And the second is a set of genes involved uh, that are associated with symbiote state. So first I'll tell you about the early heat stress response genes. These genes are characterized by being upregulated really early in response to heat. So what you're looking at here is a heat map of expression in the symbiotic time course. Oh, there it is. Okay, um, in, in early uh, heat stress in the symbiotic time course, and the x-axis is time at 34 degrees. And you can see that all these genes are upregulated very quickly at three hours. And uh, uh, hierarchical clustering of these genes identify two clear expression patterns. Cluster one are, correlate, or, or a set of genes that come up early at three hours and then are downregulated. And cluster two are a set of genes that come up early and then are downregulated more slowly. And we're interested in what types of genes were in these clusters, so I did a, a go term for both clusters. I found that cluster one is involved in many genes involved in the regulation of apoptosis or in the innate immune system. And so this is not surprising because many organisms upregulate apoptosis in the immune system in response to stress. However, we think it's interesting because there's this model that the immune system plays a role in maintaining the symbiosis, which I'll go to later. And the second cluster involved genes involved in protein homeostasis. So these are genes involved in the protein, protein folding, such as the heat shock protein um, yeah, and uh, ER stress. And so if you look at examples of these genes, these are kind of a who's who of early heat stress genes such as caspases, members of the immune system, and heat shock proteins. So there's no really su real surprises here. But the way that we made our experiment, we conducted our experiment, allowed us to get an opportunity to look how these genes behaved in the aposymbiotic state. And surprisingly, we saw a very similar expression pattern with these early heat stress response genes, with whether the animals had a symbiont or not. And so this is telling us that this early heat stress response is largely part of the core animal's heat stress response. And it really draws the question about whether or not any of these genes could be involved in bleaching themselves. In addition, the timing of these genes, uh, we don't really see bleaching until 24 hours, so much of these genes are kind of resolved well before bleaching. So it brings up these really interesting hypotheses about whether or not this stress response can be involved at all. Um, and, or they could be triggering um, a, a downstream set of events that ultimately leads to bleaching, even though their products are downregulated. Um, and I just wanted to show those examples again with the AVO symbiotic time course to show how similar these genes are. We were able to find differences in this early heat stress response between, between APO and SIM. So here's a set of genes that are upregulated in SIM that don't appear to be as upregulated. In APO, and another set of genes that are uh, that seem to be shifted in when they're upregulated in the APO symbiotic time course. And when we looked at the types of genes that behave this way, we got a really surprising result in that none of these genes were obviously related to the oxidative stress response. So, one of the major models of coral bleaching is that photosynthetically derived ROS causes tissue damage to the host causing bleaching. And actually we saw no differences, no, no obvious differences that there's a different that there's a, a differential oxidative stress response, um, whether or not the animals have a symbiont or not during heat stress. So I think it really makes us wonder whether or not we need uh, additional models in this context to describe bleaching. And this point is actually illustrated even more by previous work in our lab, in the Pringle lab, that showed that bleaching actually occurs at the same rate in the light and the dark. So it really draws into this idea that maybe photosynthetically derived ROS is not a major contributor to bleaching in this system. And uh, in this paper, we also showed a similar result in coral. And so my future lab is going to be focused on trying to understand new models of coral bleaching and try to test while testing the old ones. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. So looking at these heat maps, I became struck by the fact that all these genes are upregulated very quickly and concertedly, and it made me wonder whether or not there's a master transcriptional regulator of this early heat stress response. 
And so in order to ask if there are master of transcriptional regulators, I performed a promoter analysis um, to find punitive transcription factor binding sites in the genes that are upregulated in response to stress. So what I did is I talk, took the top 100 genes that are upregulated in, 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 um, in symbiotic animals, and I walked upstream of their putative transcription factor binding sites and grabbed the 400 base pair, or five, sorry, 500 base pair region, and looked in those putative promoter elements for sequence motifs that are rich that could be transcription factor binding sites. Okay. And I found two such sites. In the, in the top 100 genes, I found 28 and 29 instances of nf kappa B, which is a perfect um, match. The subsequence is a perfect match to the human, a near perfect match to the human nf kappa B site. And this is interesting because nf kappa B is a known master regulator of the immune system. And so it makes perfect sense that it could be orchestrating some of these early heat stress response genes. The second site was found was HSF1. So HSF1 is the heat shock transcription factor, and that, like its name suggests, this transcription factor is involved in upregulating genes in response to heat. So this is a nice positive control that we're seeing the types of regulators that are known from other systems. These transcription factors themselves are upregulated in response to stress, giving credence to the idea that they could be involved in this regulation. And now we wanted to ask whether or not the presence of or absence of nf kappa B or HSF1 binding sites in the punitive promoters of genes genome-wide had any predictive value uh, whether or not the genes would be upregulated in response to heat. And so what we did is we looked, we counted all nf kappa B sites or HSF1 sites in the promoters of genes, of every gene in the genome, and then we ranked them and asked how do those genes behave in the heat stress time course. And here are the results of that experiment. On the left is nf kappa B. On the left is nf kappa B. Um, and as you see, they're ranked ordered by the number of nf kappa B binding sites in the 500 base pairs. You can see that many of these genes are upregulated early in response to heat, and they belong to cluster 1. And remember, that's exciting because cluster 1 is enriched for genes involved in the immune system. So it makes perfect sense that, the, that nf kappa B could be regulating it because it's a known regulator of the immune system. And the opposite is kind of true for HSF1, where many genes that are HSF1 targets are actually part of this cluster 2. And so what we think we're identifying here is two distinct expression clusters in response to this heat stress. One that's driven in part by nf kappa B, another that's involved that's driven in part by HSF1, driving protein folding responses and immune responses. So this might not be so surprising to people that study heat stress and other organisms that these genes are involved. And so we decided to leverage that, the fact that these proteins are well studied in another system, to ask whether or not they have roles in symbiosis or bleaching. So the first question I wanted to ask was whether or not HSF1 has a role in bleaching itself and its downstream targets. And so what we did is we used a pharmacological <coughs> inhibitor that's available for HSF1, which prevents activation of uh, downstream HSF1 targets by HSF1 during heat. And we add, it's called CRIP11. So we added CRIP11 in the first 12 hours and removed CRIP11. This was uh, to block this early heat stress response. And then we let these animals go for another 36 hours with their heat treatments or their temperature treatments and then sample the bleaching weight. And this could allow us to ask what happens when you dampen the heat stress response through HSF1. And here are the results of those types of experiments. On the x-axis is treatment with and without drug at 27 degrees or 34 degrees. And on the y-axis is percent alpha cell remaining relative to your control. You can see that there's no difference between, uh, there's no effect of the drug on bleaching at normal temperatures, but we see an increase in bleaching rate when the anemones uh, had this early heat stress response blocked by HSF1 compared to heat alone. And so what we think this is showing us is that blocking this early heat stress response driven by HSF1 is actually uh, making bleaching worse, showing that those targets are actually protecting against bleaching. And it makes sense because HSF1 is involved in protein homeostasis, so you can imagine losing that, exacerbating the effects of stress. And now we're interested in trying to figure out how exactly that works, and so I'm doing RNA-seq experiments of crib 11 treated animals to find which targets are changing with the inhibitor. Okay, so now we also want to ask questions about NF-kappa B. 
So we wanted to ask whether or not nf kappa b was involved in symbiosis or thermal tolerance. I think the, the justification for it being involved in thermal tolerance is the fact that it's upregulated quickly in response to stress in anemones. But why would it be involved in symbiosis? And again, it's hypothesized that the immune system is required in order, in order to maintain a foreign body inside of a cell. And so we thought that nf kappa b might be a great, um, a great model or a great potential molecular mechanism of driving that immune response. And so in collaboration with Kate Mansfield and Tom Gilmore at Boston University, they had an nf kappa b antibody for the aptasia protein. And then we asked whether or not uh, uh, nf kappa b changes in expression upon the onset of symbiosis. So what you're looking at here is an aptasia larvae that's been stained with antitubulin in purple, nuclei, and nf kappa b protein in green. So these larvae don't have symbionts and they have high nf kappa b protein. When we take these aposymbiotic animals and infect them for three days with symbionts, we actually see an extensive downregulation of nf kappa b when symbiosis is established and maintained. So what we think this is saying is that nf kappa b is downregulated, and because nf kappa b is a regulator of the immune system and other systems, maybe this is a sign that the immune system is downregulated, and maybe that's a that's a requirement for the symbiosis. And this leads to another really interesting question because we, I showed you that nf kappa b is upregulated very quickly in response to stress. So if the immune suppression is required to maintain the symbiosis, what are the consequences of reactivating that immune system and over or overwhelming that immune system that's required for symbiosis? So I think this really leads us to a model where the immune system could be playing a role in the bleaching process. And this is a hypothesis that I'm going to work on in my future lab. So now to shift gears a little bit, I'm going to talk about the second set of genes that I've been working on. These are genes that are associated with symbiotic state. So previous work in the Pringle lab has sequencing sim and apo anemones, RNA sequencing, found extensive differences in gene expression based on symbiont state. And um, I'm just showing three of those genes that are differentially regulated. One is a glucose transporter, a sterile transporter. Sorry, one is a glucose transporter, a sterile transporter, and an ammonium transporter. These genes are massively upregulated in symbiotic anemones relative to the apo symbiotic state. And we think that these transporters are actually the transporters required for the nutritional aspect of the symbiosis. Remember, glucose and sterols have to be translocated from symbiont to host, and ammonium has to go inside. So we think that these upregulated symbiont-specific transporters are regulated. There are, are, there are these transporters. However, we don't have any functional evidence for this, and that's a future direction in the lab. But we were interested in asking whether or not these symbi symbiosis-associated genes actually, how do they change during a time course of heat stress in symbiotic and aposymbiotic anemones? So first, in order to ask that question, in my data set, I called differential gene expression between apo and sim. And so there are about 337 genes that are upregulated in sim relative to apo, and those are in green. And then the ones in black are the genes that are down in SEM relative to APO. And this is before heat stress. And the y-axis here is log two-fold difference between SEM and APO. And the red line here is when there's no difference in expression of a gene between SEM and APO. And so we were asked, we were wanting to know whether or not how these genes change as you heat stress the anemones. And we found that many of these genes change gradually as bleaching occurs. So as the symbiotic anemones are, are losing their symbionts, they're becoming more like aposymbiotic animals, and we can actually see the convergence uh, by gene expression profiles. So maybe that's not so surprising. But what we were really surprised by is the kinetics of this. And so we found that some of these genes actually drop really dramatically before bleaching. So by 12 hours, um, the symbiotic anemones still have somewhere between 80 to 100% of their symbionts. They really haven't even started the bleaching process, but the symbiotic genes are already down-regulated to near the aposymbiotic state. And so this suggests that, this, that the anemone is pulling away from the symbiosis before the actual ejection of algal cells from their tissue. 
And it becomes even more interesting if you look at the types of genes that are in the, that behave like this. There are about 100 genes that, that have this rapid downregulation, and three of them are a putative ammonium transporter, glucose transporter, and sterile transporter. And again, we think these are the transport, mass, major transport proteins for the symbiosis. So this is giving us evidence that early in heat stress, before bleaching, the anemones are transcriptionally pulling back from the nutritional aspect of the symbiosis. And it really begs the question whether the early down regulation of these genes could be involved in the bleaching process itself. Could the, pull, could the down regulation of genes actually trigger bleaching? And that's a question that I'm interested in pursuing in the lab. So now, um, let me just summarize what we've learned from this RNA-seq experiment. We found two waves of gene expression that seem to be associated with symbiosis, symbiosis and bleaching. First, at three hours, we see an upregulation of nf kappa b and HSF1 along with an early heat stress response. I think that based on the CRIB-11 experiments, uh, uh, modifying HSF1 function, I think that some of this early heat stress response is protective against bleaching. Between 3 and 12, 24 hours, we see a downregulation of genes associated with symbiosis, and I think that some of these genes, based on how they change relative to when bleaching occurs, these could be triggering bleaching itself. And also, there's another hypothesized mechanism where nf kappa b is, it might be critical for regulating the symbiosis, and its reactivation on pond stress could have a role in bleaching itself. So I think that we've already come up with this RNA-seq experiment. We came up with a lot of models about how bleaching can occur. But how could we actually test any of these things? And I think that that's the real trick in the system. And so the other half of my postdoc, I've really been focusing on trying to establish new, establish new genetic tools to functionally test candidate genes. So as a PhD student, when I was in Sickleback, I developed methods to knock out genes with tailings which you don't hear much of anymore. But um, the way I did that was with microinjection. And so that allows us to stick a small needle into an egg and deliver reagents of interest. The Pringle Lab had already established a way to spawn Aptasia regularly, and so I decided to develop a method in order to microinject Aptasia eggs. And here's a video of us doing that. So our microinjection method actually works pretty reliably now, and we're able to microinject at the one cell stage and rear the larvae up, and they'll become uh, viable and normally developed. Here's an example of an animal that was injected with rhodamine dextran, which is a fluorescent injection indicator. And you can see that the dye is, is, is uh, incorporated throughout the larvae, and the larvae is normally developed. So now that we could get stuff in, I really became interested in trying to uh, They'll develop tools to start to change gene function. The first set of tools that I was interested in was the tools to overexpress genes. And so the first set of experiments I did were, was to inject uh, at the one cell stage with capped messenger RNA to transiently upregulate a gene of interest. And we've done a bunch of uh, iterations of this, so I'll just show you one that will become important in a minute. We take a messenger RNA, we inject at the one cell stage. This particular messenger RNA encodes a green fluorescent protein and a red fluorescent protein in a way that both proteins are expressed on a single message um, and, and are independent of each other. And when we inject that at the one cell stage and grow up the larvae, we can generate uh, aptasia larvae that are expressing both fluorescent proteins. So this shows that we are now able to overexpress genes of interest by microinjecting. We also wanted to develop more high throughput methods besides microinjecting to, transpo to, tra to uh, transform Aptasia. And through a collaboration with two other postdocs in the lab, Chris Rinicki and Lori Ling, we made a way to electroporate messenger RNAs um, uh, at the one cell stage to also transform. So now we have a more high throughput way to transform uh, Aptasia larvae. Okay, so now that we have this micro, this overexpression method, what can we use this for? And we could begin to start asking questions like, does nf kappa b have a role in symbiosis? And remember, nf kappa b is downregulated upon the onset of symbiosis in larvae. So you can imagine experiments, and we're doing those experiments, um, to overexpress nf kappa b along, instead of the, um, the red fluorescent protein, along with EGFP with a messenger RNA. 
And now you're forcing the NF-kappa B to be upregulated in these zygotes. And you can ask whether or not the larvae are now able to form a symbiosis or not. And so these are the types of experiments that I'm currently doing now in the Pringle lab and I'm going to continue through during my, during my own lab. And I think that the overexpression uh, technologies are actually going to be pretty powerful to ask certain questions regarding symbiosis, but really the gold standard of genetics is the ability to knock out and knock down a gene. Because it leads to more clear cut, often leads to more clear cut phenotypes. And so I decided to try to build tools in Aptasia to start to knock out genes and, and knock down genes. And I wanted to find a good phenotype that we could use as a proof or principle. And the, the struggle here is that when you're making a, um, a new method, you want to make sure that you have a clear cut phenotype that you could use, and you could tell them whether or not the method was work, working. We didn't actually know what any genes do in Aptasia, so there wasn't a very obvious uh, uh, avenue for that type of work in Aptasia literature. So instead, I went to what was known in Nematostella. So Nematostella is a non-symbiotic anemone that has uh, uh, already has reverse genetic tools established and has been established for many years. So I found this paper by Technow in 2008 in the development that found that FGF signaling is required for apical tuft development. And apical tufts are these little sensory organs at the apical side of the atasia larvae. And when you treat with an inhibitor of FGF signaling during development, SU5402, it leads to loss of apical tuft development. So we think this is a really excellent phenotype that's easily scorable in aptasia larvae to see if we're able to knock out or knock down gene function in aptasia. This paper also showed that using a morpholino against FGF1A they are able to lose uh, equal tough formations. So in order to start to try these types of experiments in Aptasia, in order to develop the tools, I wanted to make sure FGF signaling was conserved in Aptasia in its role in equal tough development. And so what I did is I used that drug SU5402 to block FGF signaling um, and see if it leads to defects in the equal tough. What we're looking at here is a wild type Aptasia larvae that's been um, stained with antitubulin to mark the cilia and the apical tuft and phalloidin uh, that marks actin as a membrane marker. You can see that larvae that were uh, incubated in high doses of SU5402 have a, a, a loss in apical tuft formation. And we actually showed that this was true uh, in a dose dependent manner. So the higher doses of SU5402, the fewer apical tufts we see. And um, so this gave us the courage to, tar to target FGF1A with knockdown technologies that didn't exist to see if we can get an apical tough phenotype in Aptasia larvae. Because this seemed, apparently, based on these drug experiments, the signaling pathways can serve. And, um, and so what we did in order to get to this, um, to develop this method, is we um, use the morpholino to, that blocks the translation of FGF1A from messenger RNA, and we injected that at the one cell stage in Aptasia larvae. And this will, uh, if, if the morpholinos were able to knock down FGF function, we would expect a resulting apical tuft phenotype. The animals wouldn't have apical tufts. We also co-injected this morpholino with a fluorescent injection indicator so we could see who was successfully injected or not. And here are the types, uh, here are the types of results that we get from those experiments. On the y-axis is fluorescent and non-fluorescent based on the presence and the absence of the injection indicator that we co-injected. And on the y-axis is larvae with apical tufts. And so you can see that the animals that were successfully injected with, and retained the injection indicator and got the morpholino had a failure to form apical tufts. So we're really excited by this because it shows that with morpholinos, and we've now repeated this with SHRNAs in early studies, that we now can knock down genes in Aptasia to study their gene function. We're not particularly that interested in apical tuft development. We're interested in genes involved in symbiosis, but this was just the first pass. 
And I'm also developing tools to use knockdown with being powerful, but we also want to knock out genes with CRISPR-Cas9. And so we're using, uh, I'm injecting CRISPR-Cas9 into Aptasia larvae to make mutations um, and disrupt gene function permanently. But I think with the tools that we've already developed, we can start to ask important questions regarding symbiosis in Aptasia. So we could ask genes like, what, what are the, what, ask questions, what are the genes required for symbiosis? For example, we can ask, are the transporters that we predict shuttle the nutrition between host and symbiont, do they actually do that, and are they required for the symbiosis to maintain? And again, this is of particular interest because we see an early down regulation of these genes upon heat stress. So by doing these experiments, not only do we learn something about the function of these transcription or these, these transporters, but we also learn something about whether or not the down regulation uh, uh, of these genes could be driving the lesion itself. And we can do experiments where we transform larvae at the one cell stage infect with alpha symbionts and ask whether or not that fails or not. And these are experiments that I'm planning on doing in my future lab. Okay, so for the last half of my talk, the last bit of my talk, what I'm going to be telling you about is, um, so I told you in the first half that Atasia is a great model system, and we need a model system because corals are hard to work with, but I don't have to convince anybody here, we're actually fundamentally interested in coral biology, in coral symbiotes. So we actually want to be able to relate the things that we're learning in an Aptasia model system to actually ecologically relevant species on the reef. And so I began to ask myself the question whether or not I could develop similar tools in corals to study gene function. And this has been a collaboration with Marie Strader and Misha Metz at UT Austin and Lena Bay. Misha Metz and Marie Strader were involved in the first paper, and the collaboration has continued with Lena Bay at the Australian Institute for Marine Science for the past three years. So unlike Aptasia, where we could spawn them every week in the lab, doing functional genetics in corals is a little bit different, where corals spawn once a year in the middle of the night by the full moon off the coast of Australia, and so at least the corals in Australia spawn off the coast of Australia. And so, so this is logistically challenging, but the concepts that I already told you are the same. So we're going to try to develop micro-injection tools, catch corals that are spawning in the middle of the night by the full moon, fertilize them, and inject them with reagents to knock down genes of interest and see if we can do that. So what we did is I flew to Australia, got Eppendorf to give us a temporary injection rig there, which now we have our own, um, and uh, tried to do this. And our strategy to functionally test genes and corals was to use microjection and inject uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And the way that CRISPR works, the way that we decided to use it, was that um, we made in vitro transcribed sgRNAs that would target a gene of interest and, in, and um, purified Cas9 protein. We mix those at a tube prior to spawning. That would make in vitro uh, SGRNA Cas9 complexes. We inject those complexes into one cell zygotes. And once inside the cells, the Cas9 complex would go to a particular site in the genome and make double strand breaks based on the sequence of the sgRNA, that, that's the guide that tells it where to go in the genome. And it'll make double strand breaks at that target site. And when the double strand breaks are repaired, you, by homologous injoining, non-homologous injoining, you'll get small insertions in the lesions. Now if this happens in, the gene, in a gene of interest, then you can disrupt the gene function. We also injected just Cas9 only, as a control for the injection, Cas9 only doesn't have the ability to find a place in the genome and doesn't have nuclease activity. So in 2016, we, we uh, as our first pilot experiment, we decided to target three genes in the coral acropora, coral acropora millipora. One was FGF1A, which we think is involved in settlement and metamorphosis and two fluorescent proteins that are endogenously encoded into the coral genome. So corals have a GFP and RFP in their genome. So we thought that targeting those genes would allow us to see loss of fluorescence if the gene was disrupted. So we went there and we injected for three nights in the middle of the night. 
and we actually got successful genome editing um, where all three genes that we targeted, about 50% of the animals that we injected had mutations. So that was, a, that was a good part. The bad part of this study was that the, when you sequence DNA from individual larvae, the individual larvae weren't entirely mutants. And so that made it difficult for us to see phenotypes because you have individual animals that are part wild type and part mutant. And this is because the Cas9 activity happened late in development. So I went back in 2017 and tried again and actually got the same result. Um, but I decided to go back in 2018 and uh, try to improve the methods to increase the mutation frequency. And so I changed a bunch of things. One, I decided to inject two types of Cas9 complexes targeting the same gene. So this will make mutations at two independent sites and increase the likelihood that each individual gene copy is mutant. Two, I used experiments from Aptasia to suggest that we needed to inject a fluorescent indicator to see who was successfully uh, mutant, or sorry, who was a successfully, successfully injected or not. And that could bias our animals that were screening for a phenotype for animals that have mutations. And lastly, I chose a gene that I thought would give a clear phenotype. And so in 2018, I went back and tried these sets of experiments, and the gene that I was targeting was a gene called HSF1. And remember, that's the early uh, transcription factor that regulates the heat stress response in aptasia. And I wanted to ask the question whether or not HSF1 was involved in the coral larvae's response to stress. And with the, all the modifications to the protocol that I made, we were actually able to make over 90% of the gene copies in each individual animal that I injected completely mutant at one or both sites. And so you can see here in experiment one and experiment three, almost every copy of the genome is mutant. And so this could show us, show us that, we're, that we can make mutations in corals at a f sufficient frequency to ask what these genes do. And so we didn't stop there. We put these HSF1 mutant animals through heat stress trials. And so the way this works is we injected at the one cell stage, we let them grow up for four days, and then we heated them up for 48 hours, and we scored survival along a 48-hour heat stress experiment. And during the first 12 hours, we got a pretty exciting result. But the animals that were injected with functional guides at 12 hours just started exploding indicating that these animals were not able to tolerate heat stress. And we didn't see this phenotype at all in the animals that were just injected with Cas9 protein. We didn't just look at these two animals. We, we, we quantified this phenotype in the course of three experiments that correlated to the three times when um, the coral spawned that year. And you can see that animals that were uninjected uh, had no problems uh, surviving 34 degrees. Same is true for <coughs> animals that were injected with Cas9 protein. Animals that got functional guide RNAs and had mutation survived well at 27 degrees. And it was only when you moved the mutant animals to 34 degrees that they start dying, showing that this, this HSF1, um, mutants in HSF1 are required for coral larvae to so tolerate heat stress. And, and maybe more importantly, this shows that we can make mutations at a sufficient frequency to study gene function in coral larvae. And this opens up a whole avenues of research where we can now start to understand genes involved in early establishment and maintenance of symbiosis in coral larvae and in deletion itself. Okay, so that was in 2008. And so I just got back from Australia in 2009, 19. Um, in November, and I wanted to expand the technique not only to look for phenotypes in, uh, at the larval stage, but also in more fully developed coral. And we want to do that because there are certain traits in coral biology that you only can study at the post-larval stages. For example, trying to figure out how coral makes a skeleton. Um, corals don't make skeleton at larvae, so you have to look later. And in order to start to advance these tools to ask whether or not, uh, to ask questions like this, um, I decided to look in the literature and find candidate genes that are, that, that are hypothesized to be involved in skeleton development in coral. 
And so they found a paper by Zikola in 2015 that found a SLC4 gamma as an important bicarbonate transporter that's expressed in the cells adjacent to where the skeleton forms. And so I thought that this bicarbonate transporter would be an excellent candidate to knock out to see if we could get a skeletal phenotype. And we wanted to ask the question if SLC4 is actually required for skeleton formation. And so the experiments I did in 2019 with a team of Boston postdoc students um, is we injected cast iron guide, cast iron um, sgRNA complexes into one cell zygotes, and we raised the larvae. We induced settlement of the larvae um, by uh, using CCA chips. When when coral larvae settle, they make these beautiful flower shapes. And so what you're doing, you're looking at them from above here, and you see the little tentacle buds form, and the little mesenteries, or the gaps in the tissue where the skeleton will form in the second day. And so you can see here's an animal that's been that's grown up for another day. You can see that these mesentery gaps have been filled in with skeleton. So we took these animals, we settled them, and we measured skeleton after three days of settlement to um, ensure that every animal that could make a skeleton would have. And here are the results from that experiment. Now you're not looking at the larval juveniles from the top, we're looking at them from the bottom. And you can see that in uninjected animals, they make beautiful skeletons, kind of in the spoke wheel of a bike tire, or bike wheel, I guess. And, um, and same is true for the Cas9 proteins. The animals that don't have the mutations um, make for a nice skeleton. However, we found that animals that uh, had mutant mutations in SLC4 gamma um, by injecting uh, functional guides failed to produce skeletons, and so they made these empty septa. So we let these animals grow up for another three days and the control animals made these beautiful castles of bicarbonate skeleton underneath their tissue, and the animals uh, uh, that were injected with sgRNA and Cas9 complexes failed to produce a skeleton um, at all. And so we're really excited about this result that now we're following up on and writing up because it shows that we can look for, we can study genes later in juvenile development. And that opens up a whole path of research where we can infect juvenile animals and we can bleach them and we can study genes involved in those important later, uh, 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 later uh, uh, events in coral biology. And importantly, it shows that SLC4 gamma is a required bicarbonate transporter for skeleton formation. Okay. So the the, my approach that I'm going to take in my future lab is one that's going to be integrated. It's going to use a combination of cell biology and genetics in both Aptasia as a model system and corals to really try to understand the molecular genetic basis of symbiosis and bleaching through experiments in both systems when appropriate. So kind of use the life history advantages of both systems to, to gain progress. And I've already told you about types of experiments that were interested in do in the lab, but I just want to reiterate a few major, major questions in the lab to, uh, that we're going to initially be beginning on. First, I want to understand the genetic pathways or the cellular pathways that are required for establishment and maintenance of symbiosis. I also want to start to test genes that are regulating that, that are regulating bleaching, so try to test these long-standing models about ROS or about uh, the immune system or nutrition that could be contributing to bleaching using our new genetic tools. And lastly, which I didn't have time to tell you all about, is that I'm really interested in trying to determine how variation in the bleaching response is, is controlled. And so one exciting thing we can do in Aptasia is we could take different algal symbionts and infect them and make them form a stable symbiosis and we can bleach them over time and they'll have, based on the genotype of the algae, they'll have a very different bleaching response. And through genetic studies in Aptasia and that system, we can start to understand how different algal symbionts control host physiology and that bleaching response. And I think that's going to be a really fun uh, thing to talk about in the Chalk Talk tomorrow. And so I gotta spend the last 
few minutes just talking about uh, the amazing environment that I was in at Stanford in order to do these, do these, do these experiments. So John Pringle is, is a fantastic advisor. We had a lot of fun together and I thank him for letting me do these crazy experiments where I fly to different parts of the world trying to uh, do knockout genes. Um, Corey Credit was a postdoc in the lab and now is at Eckerd College in his own lab and started these early RNA-seq experiments I told you about. Um, Lori Ling, Ben Mason, and Chris Renicki are were postdocs in the lab um, that helped with these with the early establishment of expiration in Aptasia, and it's been really fun trying to develop these tools with them. Also, Olivia Barry, Barry which is an unsung hero, she's a lab technician that's been keeping anemones alive and getting them to spawn regularly in the lab, which is really the ba backbone of our whole research program. And then um, Amanda Tinoco and Laura Mitchison Field, these are two postback students that came with me to Australia to and, and followed my lead to try to knock out these genes and corals and really do the impossible. So they stayed up for <coughs> days and, and uh, all night to, to do these experiments. And so I can't be. Uh, uh, I'm really thankful to them. And then other members of the Pringle Lab. And so I currently have continuing collaborations that I need to address. Um, Lena Bay, who's been a, uh, at the Australian Institute for Marine Science, has been a longtime friend and collaborator that we're continuing the CRISPR-Cas9 work in corals um, using the infrastructure of the Australian Institute for Marine Science. Misha Metz and Marie Straders for, for, for early help in the first round of CRISPR experiments. And then I've actually developed international and national collaborators to start doing CRISPR experiments with corals around the globe. And so Manny Aranda and I are starting experiments to study corals in the Red Sea and using CRISPR to try to understand the genetic mechanisms behind how corals can live in such a hot environment. And that's at Kaust in Saudi Arabia. And then Holly and Debashis are uh, two of my colleagues and, and, and collaborators and friends we just started an initiative to study corals in Hawaii. And so corals, some corals in Hawaii will spawn in June, July, and August. And so that gives us ample opportunity and it's close to the west coast of the United States to be able to knock out genes at several different times a year. And then Tom Gilmore and Kate Mansfield for the work helping us try to figure out what North Kappa B is doing with symbiosis. And then I want to thank all the funding um, for the work, including the Moore Foundation and the Simons Foundation. That's it. Questions? Hi. Uh, is there anything possibly adaptive to the bleaching? So I'm thinking about that kind of uh, immune response that happens early, and maybe it'd be a good idea to you know, not worry so much about food and protect yourself from other bugs that might also grow. Totally. Yeah, so the, one of the, I, mean, I remember when I was undergrad, I was reading a paper uh, that was written in like 1998, and I was about the adapted bleaching hypothesis. And this is a, a model where bleaching is actually adaptive because it allows corals to switch algal symbionts. And so the last half of the talk, I, or the last section of the talk, I told you that algal symbionts have different effects on thermal tolerance. And so um, it could be that they change symbionts after bleaching events to find more appropriate symbionts for an, a particular environmental condition. Um, and that's, I think that that's possible. There, are, there is some evidence that suggests that those symbionts that are acquired after bleaching are actually suboptimal symbionts in terms of nutrition and other life history traits. So there might be a trade-off there. It's a super interesting question that I think we could answer some in laboratory studies in Aptasia. Uh, also, I think it would be awesome to try to find a mutation that would prevent bleaching um, and to ask what happens when you keep the symbiont inside. Right. And then, and then is, is that actually more lethal than, um, than just bleaching them and trying, hoping that you can recover after the warm weather? I think that's like, those are really cool experiments. Yeah. Hey. I have a, I guess it's kind of a technical question. I was thinking about your, your the first part of the talk with all the transcriptional regulation yeah. and uh, the heat maps. And I noticed you probably had, I don't know, hundreds, certainly, maybe even thousands of genes you're watching expression on, but you only found motor regions in like 30-ish? Yeah. Uh, what do you think is explaining 
the regulation with all those other ones then if you if they don't have the same promoter system? So or is it promoter in a different place or what? Yeah, so I think that that's that's my favorite model. So studying um, animal gene regulation, like stickleback gene regulation, for example, it's insanely complicated and you actually I actually didn't do that promoter experiment for a very long time because I didn't think it would work based on what I thought I need from corals and or sorry from stickleback and it turns out that not all the regulatory information is in the first 500 base pairs of a promoter and actually it's not even in the promoter at all sometimes they're in cis regulatory elements so I'm, I'm expecting that the regulatory logic for the other genes is more more complicated um, one way that I'm thinking about, and we've already built some data sets to start to address that, is to start measuring chromatin landscapes, open and closed chromatin landscapes, during these heat stress profiles to ask if we can find, okay, what are the, what are the, uh, what are the promoters or enhancers that are differentially regulated upon heat or upon the symbiosis states or state or every. And I think that's a, a better non-biased way to find those types of regulators. Yeah. Hi. So uh, maybe you said this, but all of your expression data comes from the host. Yeah. So what, what, what's the... What gives? <laughs> what gives that? What, yeah. what, what's the dino doing? What, yeah. what, what's happening? How could I come to a department full of... Uh, <laughs> not even talk about the algae. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. The audacity of this guy. Um, yeah, so we have the data. <laughs> and um, so... In, a, in another project, what we've done is we've heat stressed algae and culture, and we've heat stressed the algae and hospitae or in, yeah, anatomy, and, 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 and we're doing the analysis to figure out how those things are different. Early preliminary studies without the, um, without the heat stress found that the algae, let's see if I get this right, so the algae in hospitae are, uh, are nitrogen limited compared to the, how they are and how we grow them in culture, suggesting that one mechanism in which the anatomy controls the algal population is through nitrogen limitation. And that's been um, hypothesized for decades, and we can see that early in our transcriptional profile. But we haven't made so, we haven't made so much progress in trying to figure out how the, the heat stress response has differs between in hospitae and in culture, but we're, gonna, we're, we're doing it. The nitrogen limitation wouldn't agree with the Ross argument at all, then. Right? I mean, because they wouldn't be making any rust if they're not giving them a Neither, neither would the dark experiment. <laughs> it's, it's like really, it's, it, yeah. it, is, it, is, it is a real conundrum of how, and I'm not saying that Ross doesn't have a role, it's just that I think that there have to be bleaching mechanisms that are independent yeah, it's of Ross. Cool. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one more question. Anybody? All right. Well, thank you.